Hey YouTubers, I'm out here on a freezing night. Um, weather hasn't been too great lately, but anyway, this will cover a review of Manker's Uber Thrower, the MK35. So the MK35 arrived in just a generic cardboard box because, again, I want to be very clear about this. This is still a prototype sample that I received for review, and in terms of the accessory, it was just this wrist strap. Right off the bat, I'm pretty sure what's most obvious to most of you looking at this right now is just the size, the sheer size of this thing. I mean, overall, it is a pretty beefy light, and I don't have large hands, I have medium-sized hands, but let's dig into the features first. At the head of light is this thick bezel here that is crenellated, but it's fully deburred and sanded off properly so that there are no sharp edges whatsoever at all. The diameter of the head is 86 millimeters, and that's a little under three and a half inches for us US folks. The lens is AR coated as you can see there. And given it is the thrower, of course, as a giant smooth reflector, and centered within is the XHP35 high emitter that was also featured on their U21. Now there are many rungs all around the head of the light as well as the throat of the light for heat seeking purposes and that serves as pretty much the major design motif sitting on what I would call the back of the light because it's opposite end of the switch is a standard tripod mount so there are these grooves here so you could take a flathead and actually remove this if you wanted to I suppose you could replace it with something else I don't know what the thread is within but that's an option for those of you who may be interested in that on this side is the electronic side switch that governs the UI as well as the access to the blinky modes. And the barrel of the light features four oblong grooves, of which two of them have engraving ends there. This is new to me. It looks like a departure from their standard design element. So they got these one, two, and three rectangular or oblong laser engraved under their logos, as well as the model name. Then the two opposite ends, what I would call the left and right, are plain. And last but not least are various logos and carvings there. All around the body, there are these textures that are relatively smooth. They're not too aggressive, but it still does help aid with the grip on the tail cap here. And on the tail cap side, there are these crenellations with a either wrist strap or lanyard holder on either end of the light. There's this little dome here. That's to accommodate a screw, which I'll get into it in a little bit, but at least the two flat edges here does allow it to tail stand. Now regarding that wrist strap, again, I don't have large hands, but I find it fairly tight already. So if you have large hands, I'd imagine this may be problematic. So probably best to consider a true lanyard or a different wrist strap if you're considering this light. And that pretty much covers off the external elements of the designs and features. Now taking this apart, on the underside of the head, you'll see these two brass rings here. The center is for the positive node from the battery contact points, and the outer ring is for the negative. And there are more brass nodules here that are spring back, so they push hard up against the contact points. So again, center is positive, the two outer ones are negative. I took measurements off of this to determine what the voltage was. So it looks like it's running off of four cells, and that's in a 4S1P configuration because the voltage reading of four fully charged cells was about 16.8, which means all four cells are running in series. Now getting the tail cap itself off, so this is the piece that fits into the battery tube, and as mentioned, that... This little circumference here helps accommodate the screw. I'd imagine there's a bolt under there that holds this rotating base plate down. You would take the prongs, insert it into one of the holes, and match up the other one, and then finally screw it on. So this is now towards the tail end of the run. It's about a little over two hours, and I just wanted to highlight one thing. As you can see, I have this Velcro that's to cover the temp probe. So that's why you saw the little dip before on the temp as I lower this. But there you can see that LED is now purplish to indicate it's roughly about halfway through. And here you can see that the battery is sufficiently low now that it's going to turn red. The MK35 pretty much follows the soup can style size lights that was first popularized by Nikkor's TM11. And of course, owing to its Uber thrower capability, it has the largest diameter head and is obviously the largest light in my quad cell collection, regardless of how many emitters. Names are all there, but if you have any questions on the identification of these lights, throw in a comment. In terms of the handling, as I mentioned, I don't have particularly large hands and this actually fits fine. I don't have any problems with it. It's got a pretty good grip because of these 
carvings. And as mentioned, the texture, even though it's there, is fairly smooth. It does aid a little bit, but not a lot. It's really more about you getting your fingers into these grooves. So it leads to a pretty solid hold on the light. However, as I always like to mention, for those with maybe carpal tunnel syndrome or wrist ailments, this light, especially in consideration of the weight, you got four cells, the heft of the light itself may not be the most comfortable light for those out there. In terms of usage, you know, pretty much your standard usage, you got your thumb to easily operate the button, or perhaps you want to hold it the other way around. So one of your front digits could operate the light in this mode and you could still easily utilize it that way. Likewise, in a overhang grip, one could potentially use the pinky. Now I have the white balance set for compact fluorescence, thus the blue beam, but you could easily use your pinky to operate the light, or perhaps, and again, one of your digits. Now, if you have particularly large hands, that may limit you to which digit you can use, but overall, I find it fairly easy to both grasp and use. Now I wanted to discuss a little bit more about the tripod mount because I think in general most flashaholics just blow by that because aside from the you know mounting it and pointing at a specific direction, one thing they may not have considered is that the addition of a flash diffuser, and this is a newer brand one that I purchased off of Amazon, although this isn't quite the size because it was never designed for flash eye, especially one of this size, but I did kind of jerry-rig it with additional Velcro here thereby allowing it to be used in greater versatility as a off-camera light. So that way, you know, depending on how you angle it, the brightness, it definitely opens up a lot more possibilities for your photography or lighting purposes. Now say, even if like, say you were using it to fix something, the diffuse lighting definitely helps. So thereby further increasing the versatility of this light. Now, if you've been following my reviews and photography for a while, you'll note that I'm a huge fan of low-key photography, especially as it applies to product photography. And thus, this kind of lighting really helps tremendously in that aspect. Now, one thing I do wish though, was that this tripod mount was set just a little bit further back, only because of this extension of this heatsink here, it does somewhat impede the use of the tripod base plate. So, Let's just take this one for instance, right? This has a certain limitation this way, and because of that heat sink, you could not mate it to it. Rather, you had to flip it over to this side. So it does work if just barely. This one's a miniature tiny one for a Gorilla tripod, but as you can see here, when mated this way, there's not enough clearance to mount it straight forward on, so I actually had to install it at an angle and kind of use it offset that way. Now, one solution to this is you can get one of these basically miniature ball mounts that mounts to a hot shoe, but of course there are variations which could accommodate an actual tripod as well. So then you would simply take this mounted to your tripod or hot shoe like that. Then this gives you a lot more flexibility for mounting the MK35 owing to its small footprint here. And now it's ready to be mounted to a tripod or I'm hesitant to say this because this is pretty heavy. I wouldn't really go mounting it on top of a hot shoe, but if you had a hot shoe bracket holder that was strong enough, you could definitely mount it to that. But again, showing you how your flashlight equipment can be utilized to increase the versatility of your photography. I wasn't provided the original instruction manual, but after playing around with the MK35 for a little while now, I've come to realize that the UI is pretty much identical to the one on the MK34, with perhaps the exception of step five here, which on the MK34 is a battery indicator. To me, it's really just a brief flash. So I'll provide updates in case I'm wrong, but that's pretty much my gut instinct on that for now. To make it easier to understand, there are basically what they would call two groups or two group modes. I hate the use of the term modes because to me, a mode is really more about like a strobe SOS. That's That to me is a mode. This to me on the left hand side here is the output level. So group one on the left diamond here represents five distinct output levels. And group two actually includes one output level, which is the turbo, as well as a few different modes or features. Now there is also a engineering mode, which I won't get into here since I had previously created a dedicated video on that. Check out my uploaded videos but I will play around with it in the future and post updates in case it differs from this one. Let's cover the group one output levels first. From off, a quick press will always turn on the light into moonlight mode. One thing I forgot to cover earlier was that this LED that's within the center of that switch, it'll always remain on when the light is in operation. And as mentioned, it'll change from 
blue, to, which means greater than 75%, purple, which is around 50%, to red, which is less than 20%. So anyway, that will always stay on when the light is on. Now, a quick press, as I mentioned, will go into moonlight mode, as you can see there. Then each subsequent quick press from there will cycle through to the next higher level. So next step up will be low, as you can see there. Then medium one, medium two, then high. Now, in a deviation from most of the UIs out there, after high, it will actually cycle back down to medium two rather than going immediately back down to the lowest level. So, medium two, medium one, low, and then moonlight. So figure that's pretty nifty. So you don't have to cycle all the way through if you wanted to get back down to a lower level. At any one point, with the light on in a fixed output level mode, so right now I'm on low, if you shut off the light with a long press, it'll memorize that mode. So there we go, that was a long press. Then the next time, if you long press with the light off, it'll always turn back on to the last memorized mode, as you can see there. And then each subsequent press after that would cycle always upwards. What I mean by that is, let's just say if I cycle to high, and then as you saw that, I step back down to medium two, which means I'm on the declining phase of the output level cycle. And then I memorize this. The next time I turn it back on with a long click to access the last memorize mode, and then I do a quick press again, it'll always cycle upwards. So as you can see, it went back up to high. It won't continue cycling back downwards. So it memorizes the mode, but not the phase, meaning increasing or declining. So let's go back down to medium one. And I'm going to simulate a battery change here by twisting off the tail cap. And in which case, because of that long spring, I would actually have to go all the way through. Put it back on. And as you can see, that mode is memorized through battery changes. And that covers the group one output levels. Now the group two, which consists of the turbo and the blinky modes and the brief flash with the light on or off. Let's start with off first. Two quick presses will always enter into turbo mode first. Then each successive press will cycle through a few blinkies, next one being the strobe. Then after that, the SOS. Then next up is a beacon mode. And then finally, last but not least, a brief flash on the LED within the switch. Now there you saw it actually went into the last memorize mode. It kind of skipped that brief flash. I've noticed this with your other lights as well, meaning like if it stayed in the beacon for quite a while, the next engagement after that wouldn't be the brief flash. So there's a little some inconsistency. So let's do that again. Let's go into turbo, then to strobe, SOS, the beacon, and then this time a quick press Right after that, you'll see the LED light switch going into a breathe flash mode. Then after this, it will not continue to cycle the group two modes, but rather it'll go back to your last memorized output in the group one. In this case, it went back down to moonlight mode. Now these group two modes are never memorized. So let's engage group two again. So let's just say I have it on turbo. I do a long click to shut it off, meaning I want to memorize that mode. But when I turn it back on, as you can see, it went into the last memorized output, which was for now moonlight. So the group two modes can be accessed with the light on and off. Currently it's on in the moonlight mode. Quick two presses will engage turbo. Each subsequent presses goes through the group two modes, yada, yada, yada. So as previously mentioned, because you cannot physically lock out the lights due to the over long nodes at the front here as well as the back here. Sorry, I have the light off right now because I'm demoing the output. Miker has included a electronic lockout feature. And the way to engage that is with the light on or off, it's a three sequential presses of one, two, and three clicks. So watch this, okay? You saw that? One, two, and three clicks. And then the brief flash will come on indicating that it is in lockout mode and it will stay on permanently until you disengage the lockout mode. So let's just say right now, when I engage the light, doesn't matter how many times I press it, the light is locked out. To disengage it, it's the exact same thing again. And it'll enter the last memorize mode. 
as you see there. So it's a little bit tricky, right? Maybe eight out of 10 times I'll get it, the two times I'll mess it up. But overall, it does take a little practice to nail it down. But as you saw there, it works and it is definitely needed because of the fact that you cannot physically lock this light out. Now there is an upcoming change called the Dragon Breath. I don't know what that is. I assume it's like a variation of the Brief Flash. Again, I'll provide updates in my written review embedded in the links in the comments section. All right, first up we have Manker's U21. I last measured this around 8.24K lux. Now we get to Through Night's TN31. I last measured this around 9200 lux. And last but not least, we get to Manker's MK35. In terms of the throw performance, for those not familiar with my graphs by now, the left hand side here in blue pretty much dictates what the manufacturer specs are and the right side hand here is what I call it. And I think it's safe to say one looking at this chart would be immediately drawn to the longest bars, which no surprise here belongs to the Manker MK35. So they had touted a 504.1K candela, which translates to 1420 meter beam distance. I measured 476.48 on this engineering prototype with a 1381 beam distance. So not too far off. I do anticipate it to meet the numbers with the production version by the simple fact that the production versions will hold turbo for 15 minutes. Whereas this engineering prototype had a pretty steep decline and with that a reduced output, thus the reduced measurement in the throw. But however, one thing I did capture was that even after the step down, as you can see here, it's still pumping out a pretty steady 343K candela, which translates to 1172 beam distances. Now, this easily trounces even after the step down, both the through 19 and 31 and its little sibling, the Manker U21. One thing I did started doing with these measurements is I started recording the ambient temp because the TN31 and the U21 both measured slightly higher as a result of benefiting from the lower ambient temp, which is about 10 degrees lower than when I last measured it during the U21 review, which was around summertime. So right now it's wintertime, it's a bit cooler. Thus again, you see these readings. In real life, if you live in warmer climes, you could probably expect slightly worse output than this. Of course, depending on your overall ambient temperature, but just something to keep in mind. But in summary, Manker MK35, I dubbed the, the new thrower king in my collection. In terms of the beam profile, despite being an uber thrower, the MK35 still has quite a punch to its flood as well. Here you can see pretty much at equidistance, the TN31 on my left hand side, the MK35 on my right, it's got a nice broader flood to it as well. And here they are side by side. As you can see, the beam profile is slightly wider, meaning the flood area. And in terms of the tint, I do have this on fixed exposure with sunny white balance. And the TN31 that you see there does have a palish greenish tint as was typical of the cool white XML2 versions. And on my right hand side, the MK35 does have a very pleasant white to it. I would hesitate to call it neutral because this is indeed a cool white version. They will be releasing a neutral white version in the future. In the interest of time, I only did the runtime on Turbo for now. I'll post updates as I get around to them. But the story here is that using four of Manker's 3400 milliamp an hour cells, I was able to achieve a total runtime of three hours. And again, that's by NCF01 standards, which states the time it took into a drops past 10% of the initial value measured, which was 2440 lumens. Now the production sample is anticipated to be around 2550 lumens but this is what I captured for this engineering sample. Another key difference here is that you'll note the steep decline as soon as the light turns on. So the production sample is anticipated to hold turbo for at least 15 minutes before it does a step down to roughly 1600 lumens. On my engineering sample, this lasted no more than one and a half minutes. As you can see here, here's a blow up 
of that plot. Right off the bat, it starts somewhere in the neighborhood of 2700, starts dropping, does a little semi-quasi regulation for just under a minute, and then starts another decline, which is the step down, and then runs perfectly regulated at 1600 after the minute and a half mark. Now the voltage I start with four fully charged cells, 16.8 volts, ending voltage was about 11.86 total. So they ended up somewhere around the neighborhood of 2.9 volts each. Not too healthy. I wish they would have a higher limit before the low voltage warning kicks in because, again, 2.9 volts is not healthy for any cells, even for IMRs. Now, in terms of the temperature line, you're going to see this weird little dip here. This was because of me poking around at the Velcro that covers the temperature probe. I was checking to see when the low voltage warning would kick in. So just ignore that. Pretend it's just a perfectly smooth line, including this dip here as well as that dip there. But because of the kick down so fast after one and a half minutes, the light didn't get meaningfully hot. I mean, max reach was 95 degrees. Although on a production version, I do anticipate it to be a bit warmer because of that 15 minute hold before a step down. Also, one additional note is that with that increase duration in turbo mode, the total runtime on turbo will be decreased to two and a half hours on the production model. I've had this light for roughly two weeks now, and despite it being an engineering prototype, Manker doesn't cease to impress me with their build quality and their fit and finish. I mean, pretty much at this point, it's safe to say they've got the machining down, regardless of, you know, new design motifs or engravings or whatnot. But at the risk of sounding cliche-ish, this light is built like a tank, owing to its overall size, as well as the extra material required for the heat sink. You got a beefy tube for the batteries. The crenellations on this bezel was perfectly machined. There's absolutely no roughness at all, no sharp corners, all fully deburred. Now, one thing of note is that I initially thought that this bezel was aluminum, but apparently it's not. It's I, I'm hesitant to call it stainless steel because it doesn't quite have the temperature or coolness of it, but it's past the magnet test, albeit just barely. Stainless would have a little bit more nickel in it and the magnet would have attracted a lot stronger So not really quite sure what this material is. So for now, I, I don't know I'll tentatively call it stainless steel happy to be proven wrong I'll ask the manufacturer, but overall design subjective of course I find it interesting, right? I actually prefer the looks of the u21 But in the light of this size the focus has always been on the heat sinking Though like I said with the prototype it didn't really need it, right? Because turbo only lasts about a minute and a half, but on the production versions with that 15 minute runtime in turbo, that he would be significant, I'd imagine. The continued use of a side switch, the tactile feedback is okay. It's not quite as crisp as like say, maybe perhaps on the U21. They will have a revised switch. I'm not sure what it is, what the finalized version will be, but I'll provide updates in my written review. Again, excuse the blue beam due to compact fluorescent white balance, but it gives you, the UI continues to be favorable for me because I like it that you could actually cycle up and down without needing to cycle through the whole thing again to get to where you want. Then you have the group two modes which are hidden, your blinky modes, your beacon and SOS in case you use this for camping or whatnot. Wrapping off the fin finish, the HA3 finish is all done with absolutely none missing again. Great, considering that this is an engineering prototype, laser engraving, all finished with no blotchiness in there whatsoever. Now, if I had to nitpick, it would be that that, it's a little hard for my camera to focus, but the tripod bolt is one hair's length off of being flush. <laughs> I mean, again, if I have to really dig that hard to find fault with this light, I mean, that that's pretty telling, right? The only other nitpick, I, as I had mentioned earlier, is that I am able to generate some noise in the tail cap PCB if I rotate this quickly enough without batteries inserted. But again, that's really being nitpicky. I did already provide the feedback. They'll be adding grease between the bolt and the screw. So I expect that to not have any issues. Now, the only other nitpick I may have is the included wrist strap. I mean, without being a dead horse here, I don't have particularly large hands. And as you can see here, this has already pretty much reached the circumference here. So this may prove to be problematic with those particularly large hands. Thus, I would like to see a proper lanyard of decent circumference included in here. The finished version will include a nice holster. I don't know what that looks like yet, but I'll send pictures if I get a hold of that. And for those considering a monster thrower, I mean, this is definitely ranks as one of the top out there. I am aware of the TM42. I don't have one on hand for review, so I don't really know how its performance is, but on paper, I think it slightly betters this. I'm gonna try to see if I could get a hold of the one, but I think there are also, perhaps there's a Phoenix out there as well. So right now, 
this is the Thrower King in my collection. Of course, that's not fair, right? Because there's only one really in this particular four cell slash giant reflector head. In the future, hopefully when I get more lights, I'll definitely do a comparison and a uh, smackdown to see, you know, who reigns supreme. But hit up my written review. I think I've got a pretty good analogy in there, utilizing Marvel's Age of Avengers as a theme. But for now, the only other things that I thought would be pretty cool to include would be this four cell definitely has a lot of energy. So I figured it would be pretty cool if they had an additional module here, maybe like a Bluetooth module that you could add in between the head and the body. So that way you could control it via a smartphone app, iOS or Android. Another feature I thought is maybe in lieu of the head, there will be kind of like a new cap here and with multiple USB ports so one could kind of use it as a portable charger because certainly you know with four cells in there especially at higher milliamp hour batteries you could definitely use it as a portable charging solution. I really like the tripod mount because as mentioned especially if they had a diffuser you could use this for photography or whatever any other purposes it greatly increases the versatility. I've got samples of that in my written view view so again hit that up but as an initial conclusion for now as I had mentioned in the throw summary section Manker MK35 I've dubbed the, the thrower king in my collection. Great job Manker. Now before I end this review given that the weather hasn't been great here and especially how cold it is I didn't get a chance to do a great outdoor comparison before now here are some quick and dirty shots I took. This is the control shot. And just feel free to pause the video to get a lengthier look at each shot. Here's the Manker U21. Unfortunately, again, boneheaded move, I forgot. I set the white balance to auto, so it may not be fully accurate, but it's reasonably so. Here's Through Nice TN31 XML2 version. And last but not least, the new Thrower King, the Manker MK35. As mentioned, when the weather improves, I will get out there to do a proper outdoors comparison, so apologies for that. But for now, this will have to do. As part of FTC disclosure, the Manker MK35 was provided for review. The batteries were purchased by me for personal use.